Would you like to master the airbrush? Welcome to the dojo. Airbrushes. To most of us, they default as our tool for priming miniatures, but there's so much more they're capable of. So I want to share my experiencing in using this weapon to combat my miniatures painting. And it starts with a sparring partner. So I've selected the greatest warriors I could from this month's One Page Rules fantasy offering, the Saurian Snake Swarms. These vicious combatants will tackle our knowledge of the airbrush to its utmost. We've been approached by the Spinosaurus Challenger as well. One of my favorite sayings for all things creative is a really simple one. Garbage in, garbage out. Usually it relates to things like photography and video editing, where if a picture was too dark or too light, there's only so much you can do to make it normal again. But if it was shot right the first time, then you barely have to edit it at all. Same goes for paint in our airbrushes. If we put something in too thin, it's going to come out too thin something too thick, and it might not come out at all. So we want to get the ratio right for whatever we're trying to do. Airbrush thinners purport to make this simple, just a few drops to thin the paint and it should flow nicely. Which, sure, I guess that works, but I always find it's very easy to mess up the ratio and widely inconsistent to get right. So my method instead is to actually get a medium that itself is the perfect viscosity to run through the airbrush clear. Since it won't change its viscosity regardless of volume, adding too much doesn't matter. It only becomes about how much color to add, either just a little for something opaque, or as saturated as you can get it while keeping the same viscosity of the medium. Unlike primer layers and dark color base coats, when it comes to detail painting with the airbrush, bull rushing out a thick layer isn't the way to go about it. By the very nature of the tool, by thinning the paint just to make it flow through it, the paint will be more dilute and transparent. So getting a single opaque even coat, unless with an airbrush paint specifically for that, is kind of impossible. So just like a normal brush, we want to work in layers. Starting with a first thin layer, then using the airbrush to help it dry, then adding another, and another, and another, until that color gets slowly built up. So all the techniques I'm about to show, except for one, are almost always going to require a buildup of color like this. The first mastery is a familiar one, as it's kin with a familiar concept, zenithal highlighting, which of course uses the angle of spray to create shadows. Other than priming, it's probably the main reason most of us first bought our airbrush, a top-down, 45 degree angle is pretty simple, but what about mastering all the other ones? By using really sharp angles, we can get some interesting shadows. It's something I do with pre-sculpted bases all of the time. By angling the airbrush almost 90 degrees to the surface of the base, it can create some really long and deep shadows among the noise of the sculpt. For a miniature, taking sharp angles to things can give us the same kind of shading when doing a light color over a dark like a zenithal does, but with tons more saturation or hue changes, but requires a bit more precision with the angles. So on these snakes, I want to change the angle of spray along the backs of the snakes so that their tiny scales only ever catch spray from the front. For very subtle textures that have gentle slopes like cloth, a steep angle can really pick them out as well. On the dino here, his back webbing has some folds in it but by taking a steep angle with the airbrush, it'll just perfectly miss the thin shadows, which might take a lot more guesswork with a normal brush. Just because Zenithal is simple, doesn't mean it can't use a bit of mastery. And this is kind of something I want to drive home as well, which is why I often repeat it. But life is just better with color. And that includes Zenithal's. While normally black is the color of choice as a base for zenithal highlights, it's not actually a very friendly tone to a lot of other colors. It turns yellows, green, oranges, and reds have a hard time showing up over it, blues and greens get really desaturated. So while white is absolutely the right color for the highlight, 
I always find the best thing for what it goes over to be other colors, complements and harmonious colors to show up through what you want the final colors to be. So for these snakes, I'm using greens, blues, and teals darkened with a little bit of black, just to get some colors down before doing my zenithal. One of my favorite mastery skills with the airbrush is to actually do all of my glazing with it. There's two reasons to do it. The first reason is to blend between layers. So if I'm brushing in textures like on the dino scales here, brush strokes are going to become quite visible between the two shades of blue. I can make the color changes very gradual, but then I'm going to have to do this big beast with about 12 layers, which could take forever. However, if I drop that to about four different layer colors, but between each one I use my airbrush to slowly build up some additional layers of the last color I just used to make the highlight in a dilute solution, it'll feather those highlights out a bit and bring some of the darker colors in the same area lighter so that I get a gradual change from dark to light, but still get all that texturing and layering in between them. The other way I use glazing is to change the ambience of a model through hue shifts and color fades. This works to make dynamic shadows by changing the colors in those shadows from cool to warm and vice versa. So around the big lizard's body, if I hit the shadows with a dilute and warm dark red, it'll make them stand out, but without getting too black or dark. And it doesn't take a full layer or anything like that, but just a hint of that color can really change a piece. This effect works for overall areas as well. Let's say I want his extremities to be a little more purple than blue. By giving them a light glaze with the airbrush with the dilute purple in it, I can start light and start to layer that glaze more and more towards the feet and the tip of the tail, getting a gradual color change that also retains the textures underneath it. Hey! Did you know you can wash with an airbrush? Because you can. Remember at the start when I talked about what goes in comes out? Well, if we make the paint thin and less viscous, we can actually use it to wet the whole surface of something where it'll then fall into the details. I like to use the matte fluid medium as normal, but then add the airbrush thinner and ink along with the paint to make it really loose and staining. So that's my mix recipe. As for how it gets on the model, if I were to go slow and steady and in layers like glazing, I'd end up with a glaze. So it's pedal to the metal for this, making sure enough of the mix comes out to saturate the area and pool up. Because we're doing the whole thing, having the paint spread out into the cracks is actually going to work in our favor and gives us a whole surface, even wash. Masking is also another important thing to know with airbrush mastery. And there's two types, a full mask and a quick mask. A full mask requires some materials. This sticky tack putty is a pretty common one as it's also something we can use to stick models to painting holders. Flattened out a bit and shaped to the model, this can be molded into the gaps. It should come off without taking any of the paint with it, but don't leave it on too long or it might take a bit more work to get it off. Another material that's good for this is plastic wrap, the kind used to wrap up your sandwiches. It can mask a large area rather quickly and bends effortlessly around the surfaces you need it to. It's not for accurate masking as much as it is to control overspray. But with a combination of both, we can get a really detailed mask quite fast, using the plastic wrap to cover most of the surfaces, then the white putty just to get those formed around the edges and hold it in place. And once it is all in place, we can get as sloppy as we need to without worry about the paint job underneath. The other kind of mask is a quick mask, and that involves using your thumb or a bit of paper to just protect specific areas. If I want to make a gradient along this gold part, I can use my thumb to block off the opposite sides, either direction so that I don't end up making the middle too bright. It's basically a quick, effective way to prevent a bit of overspray. Similarly, with a paper or cardstock, I can use it to prevent overspray or to create sharp edges and lines. Just quickly getting it into place, giving a few sprays, and lifting it away will give a sharp line that feathers off.
Airbrushes are expensive tools, and while they're worth it just for priming and xenophils, getting more out of it can increase its value tenfold. A fast wash here, a quick base there, a subtle glaze or shadow there and there can really speed things up, as they are quite a lot simpler and faster with the airbrush. So by practicing these techniques and making them second nature to you, it'll have the side effect of actually speeding up your painting as well. Please subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this one or just other fun things to do with painting miniatures. And until next time, enjoy your own painting journey.